What's up guys, this is Heist, and today we've got another Heist Reacts. This time we're talking about another safety video. But it's the safety video everyone requested after last time, getting off on the right foot by the Union Pacific put out in the early 1970s. And I'm pretty sure this is actually the one I was thinking of when I went and watched the Rio Grande one that we did last time. Um, because this is what was shown to me when I was a new Breakman. At least I think it is. Uh, but I haven't watched it in a long time, assuming it is the right one. Anyways, so we're going to get into this and uh, see what safety in the 1970s looked like. Last time it was the 50s, now we're in the 70s. So make sure you grab your safety whiskey and, uh, you know, don't try this at home. As always, I'm going to link the whole video down in the description if you don't want to deal with me talking over top or interrupting it and just want to watch the video. But uh, most of you folks tend to come here because you want to see what I have to say about it. So that's why we do these things. Getting ahead in any game is largely a matter of getting off to a good start. Staying happy, sometimes staying healthy in any game. Don't do that. It's often bad. depends on getting off on the right foot. <laughs> Don't do that either. Taking care to get off on the right foot, so to speak, is really one of the first things you learn about staying healthy around a railroad. <laughs> I'm pretty sure this is it, because I remember many shots of a brakeman doing the wrong thing and then eating it, basically. <laughs> All you East Coasters who say my hand signals are wrong, pay attention. Take it from an old head who's been battered, bumped, and bruised just because he was a little bit careless. A little bit careless, that's like being a little bit pregnant. Come on, <laughs> I'll give you some tips on staying in this game. Jeez. Yeah, well, he's got a point. Getting off on the right foot is of first importance on this job and is a good starting point for my empty-headed friend here and me to show you, on the one hand, how to play safe and, on the other, how you can get hurt around engines and cars. The right foot to get off with is the trailing foot, the one opposite the direction you're going. Of course, you're looking ahead. Put that foot near the ground so you step, not jump off. Make it easy on your feet. Let go with your leading hand so you swing away from the car, facing the direction of travel. And your other foot then comes out of the stirrup. When the second foot touches, let go the other hand. Same thing goes for leaving engine or caboose steps. see what can happen if you're looking where you've been. Step off with a lead foot and let go with a trailing hand. Slip up on any one of these points and you may fall. Better remember that because we can't pad the 4,800 miles of yard and side tracks on this railroad. <laughs> so, this is definitely the film I was thinking of. Because, yeah, they, they do this and show it off. And, and this technique is actually really critically important. Um, a lot of railroads don't allow it. And they've, they've gone back and forth on whether or not they allow folks getting on and off moving equipment. Um, it ends up being one of the things where people get injured the most for not following this or trying to do it while the train's going too fast. Which adds additional complexity or there's not safe footing and everything, right? So some railroads have banned it and then unbanned it or all this sort of stuff. But uh, it's one of those things that if you're really railroad in for real, it saves you a crap ton of time if you don't have to stop a 7,000 foot long cut of cars and then restart it just to get off. They always say that uh, a good railroader is a lazy railroader and you ride everywhere you can. And if that means you have to stop every time you've got to get a switch or cut a car out or something, it ends up adding a lot of time. 
And so a lot of railroaders who really do this full time will say like, oh God, like if we had to stop every time, it would just suck. Um, that said, it does add a little bit more danger, particularly if you're not doing this the right way. So the way he's illustrating it and saying it is absolutely the way to do it. Now in the tourist railroad museum scene, like we're not running 7,000 foot trains. We're not even running 700 foot long trains most of the time. Probably never have. It's fine. Details. Uh, so we just don't do it. We train everyone how to do it this way in the event of an emergency and you got to get off moving equipment or get on moving equipment. This is how you do it. But we don't do it in standard practice just because there's no need to have that extra risk when we're doing something at light service like what we're doing. There's one right way to get on too. Watch the outside ladder you're going to get on. Grab the rung with both hands. If the car's moving left to right, jab your left foot into the left corner of the stirrup and you're all aboard. It's the whole point of those stirrups being like the that and why the boots left, you wear are the way they are. The right foot into the right jam it in that corner, make sure that you've got good firm footing. And as the Philly said to the jockey as she backed into the starting gate, there's a wrong way too. Here's going too far with the ah. but unsure foot. If that just didn't make every railroader who's watching this just go, ah, uh, not, no, don't do that. Not good. It's, uh, it's one of the reasons why we talk about having a defined heel. So you can jam that heel in the stirrup like that. Super important. Make sure you got the right PPE, boots included. When you put the proper foot in the wrong corner of the stirrup, it's not only inconvenient, but neither the time nor the place to invent a new dance step. I've seen that happen. Don't do that. <laughs> not only is there unavoidable junk around a yard, but there are some necessary obstacles like switch stands to watch for when you're getting off. Always ride past these obstacles rather than dodging them. This guy had some huevos to do this stuff. On too. Move beyond the switch stand before you board. Duh. <laughs> Now, some switch stands have to be closer to a track than others. Watch for these not only when getting on or off, but also when you're riding. <laughs> like that can really sting. That would really hurt. All right. Now you're on the car. How do you stay there until you're ready to get off? Don't do what you say. Don't do Just that. Grab a hold, and you have an unscheduled stop. Look at that old Rio Grande box. That was fun. That is definitely one of the things that a lot of people don't realize. And this is where a lot of like amusement park slash tourist railroad slash museum regulations come in on train. Uh, when the train's in motion, people have to be seated is because if there's a sudden something, car pulls out in front of you, trainee engineer grabs the independent, you know, any one of these things, the railroaders are going to be braced and ready for that sort of thing. And other folks, maybe not so much. So most railroads tend to say like, hey, you have to be seated. You can't ride platforms. You can't do this. The other thing, you know, there's exceptions to every rule, but all that comes from if there's a sudden slack motion in the train or something, no one's going to get thrown around just like this because that's a very real danger. And you got to make sure that you're riding the proper way so that if something does happen, you can hang on. That's the whole point of this thing. You ride not only with both hands and both feet, but with both eyes. This is using your eyes, but not your head. And you're heading for trouble. That sign also means get off. I really wonder how they cast this guy. Like, is this some guy in his retirement week and he's like, yeah, if I accidentally do this stun a little wrong and I get run over and die, it'll be fine. Like, because <laughs> they really sell it. I, I mean, I don't know if it's some amount of video trickery too, where they're making it look like he, he 
just turning around and realizing things probably, but um, a lot of that stuff's actually really dangerous if he had not been prepared for it. So it's, uh, it's fun to see. There's really no good reason to ride a footboard since you can do a job like pulling the pin more safely from the step. <laughs> and these days, footboards are not allowed. <laughs> <laughs> they got rid of them for this reason. When you're pulling pins from the ground, you're naturally walking and looking the same way the car is moving, because that's where your signs are coming from. Once the slack is in for sure, the safest way to do it is to use the hand that's next to the car. Doing it cross hand or with both hands will work, but suppose you stumble. While you're fighting for your balance, you're apt to swing between the cars, or at best make a bad job of it and waste everybody's time. So comment below if you're a modern day conductor on the class one or on a short line or anything like that. Because um, this is switching that I don't do. I don't get to do that. We always pull the pin when we've stopped. We don't end up kicking cars or doing anything like that uh, while moving. I suppose you would be doing that all the time on a hump job or something like that. But uh, uh, I'm not familiar. Is that common practice these days or not? I'd, I'd love to hear. Share your comments down below. We've been talking about safety around moving cars. You can also get hurt around cars that are standing or that should be standing. Did you ask for that in between? Sometimes call a glad hand. That's a good one because it can really whack you if you're careless. There's a knack to coupling air hoses that's not only the easiest way, but the safest. Most important, you stand so that you can get out fast if the cars should move. Just like that. This time's false alarm could be next time's real thing. It's like defensive driving. Doing one thing and being ready for something else. Absolutely. Keep your ears open for slack running in or out that'll tell you something's about to move. And make sure you've got an this in-between or a red zone. God, they actually did that to that guy for the video. <laughs> Good work. But don't like I so said. Far out of the frying pan that you leap into the possible fire of something moving down that next track. That man had some huevos to do this video. And grabs the nearest hose. Pulls it to you and kinks it. Right hand then takes this hose, and the left hand takes the other hose and raises it to where glad hands are at a right angle. Thank you for the diagram. Bring Good. Them together and snap them. Okay, I have to take an aside here because this is one of my favorite stupid things just watching this. Uh, when I started at BNSF, I was a management trainee, later a mechanical foreman. And so it was a bunch of college students, and I was the only one that had any railroad anything. And, and railroad anything was the museum for me, which is not really railroading, but it's dealing with stuff like air hoses and, and actual train operations, just not to the same scale and caliber of all you fine folks on the Class 1. <laughs> And they put us through, like, Railroad 101, like, hey, this is how you do train stuff so that we could bond with crews or whatever and have an understanding of what employees were going to go through. And we got to the point where everyone had to hook up the air hoses, the glad hands from the cars in, in this one little remote yard in Kansas City. It was basically just two tracks. Very, very crazy. Um, and watching all of my classmates struggle at hooking up the glad hands, and it's like... I mean, there's a little nuance to it, but come on, like, this is easy mode, because standard gauge hoses are stupid long. On the narrow gauge, we have some hoses that are like eight inches, and you have just absolutely no room to bend it and get it in place. Everything's tight and confined, and uh, yeah, we have it worse than you do, so, you know. <laughs> it was funny to watch everyone struggle and then just go up and katunk. Hey, okay, thanks, bye, I'll, uh, next. Somebody else do it. A glad hand can be a bad hand if you don't hold a hose when you open the angle cock. Yeah, that's how you get your nuts cut off. Forget this. Or your shin broken. Never hurt anybody. But the machinery between it and you certainly can. 
got to lean on the drawbar or knuckle to reach the one across from you, but don't put your hand or your side near an opening that can close. It's not always what's up front that Great comes. demonstration. A car has to move only a couple of inches to give you a hell of a squeeze. Don't couple yourselves up. Any part of you. Oh, look at these cars. You know, this means it's a better stop. era. You know, this means proceed. And as of now, you know that this means don't move this car this cut for this engine. Blue signal when you protection. See it on a car, a cut of cars, or an engine. Blue flags are put up by car men and may only be removed by them. If you pull off a blue flag, you're juggling somebody else's life in your hands. And you've also got your walking papers. Blue flag is mechanical. It's not just car shop. If you're talking about a cut of cars, it's car shop. But we have the same thing in the locomotive shop. And it was the one thing I almost had to fire somebody for once. Um, they they actually got canned for other reasons <laughs> shortly thereafter. Apparently he had uh, many issues. He was uh, a gentleman that was on his probationary period and didn't work out. Was not fit for the railroad, apparently. But um, if you violate blue flag, like that is the biggest thing. That was the one thing that guys got written up for the, for the, for the most. You have to have a flag on the piece of equipment you're working on and access to that piece of equipment has to be secured as best as it can be, depending on if you're on a main track, if you're on a siding, you know, or if you're in the roundhouse, there's little nuances to it about whether or not you're putting a flag out in front, locking the switches out and all that. In mechanical limits, it was always lock the switches away from you so no one can come through and couple into you unless you have, uh, Unless they unlock the switch, right? Which is theoretically a lock that only you or a mechanical personnel has. So no one's going to come in and couple into the engine that you're on. And uh, th that applies to anyone who is on, under, in between rolling equipment as a mechanical personnel. So if you're working in the cab, you still had blue flag. Just in case. Because if you went out to look at something, somebody came and coupled in as you're right up and looking at brake rigging or something. Uh, that's how you get run over. And... It's one of the biggest things and the biggest protections the mechanical department has. So, yeah, people who violated blue flag got some time off, if not done. Like, you're out. Because uh, it was one of those absolute things that you do not violate this. If you took someone else's flag down, anything like that, I mean, you could seriously endanger someone. And so that's still true to this day. Now this bag is built to take all the right jabs and left crosses you can give it. Guy's got to be tough in the ring. But nobody's tough enough for this kind of fist. I'm glad we got he that demonstration. The rule book says don't cross between cars less than 10 feet apart. But take my advice That's and make changed. It 15 feet. That's about three bantamweight fighters laid end to end. Now, most of you fellas are young and rugged. All of you have two of most everything. Two eyes, two ears, two arms, and so on. But only one back and one neck. Be extra careful not to risk things you've only got one of. A simple operation like setting handbrakes should be done with care. Always. Doing this the lazy way from the ground is really the hardest and a real strain. Get where your two legs can help your one back. From here, you can do it with one hand and have one left for hanging on. Just in case some guy jerks the car. So that's another altruism within railroading, uh, handbrakes and setting handbrakes to actually get a good crank down on a ratchet brake or an old style staff brake that doesn't have a ratchet. You got to apply some serious force. And this is after the era when everyone was running around with brake clubs to tie down cars. Uh, so you had it a little bit better than running around with your baseball bat to tie things down, basically. 
But you still have to put down significant force on that wheel to tie down the brakes sufficiently so that the car is not going to roll. And you're talking about securement of a train, rolling stock, whatever it is. If that rolls away, that's on you as the conductor or the brakeman, whoever it is. So you got to make sure you tie it down tight. And he's absolutely right. Like body mechanics and body positioning on that stuff is pretty like significant, particularly with all the different types of geometries on different types of rail cars. So absolutely, if you can use both legs and one back, make sure you're using that and not just the one back. Uh, it's also one of the reasons why you'll see most locomotives these days have push button handbrakes. That was a, a big mod that we did at the shop all the time. Power coming in was, you know, we would be replacing the handbrake with one that's got a motor on it so that you just press the button, it ties it down, it removes the potential for mechanical injury to the thing that somebody probably interfaces with most common. You may not interface with that car or that car, but that switch engine that you're running for 12 hours, well, it's probably the thing you're going to end up interfacing with the most. So, uh, <clears throat> And readily available power and all that. So a lot of locomotives got those mods on, on the bigger railroads. On this type of car, they've given you a safe perch off the ground in case of sudden movement. <laughs> hey, you! <laughs> Movable is the magic word. A car often moves without warning. On some tracks, it'll move by itself. Some yards and a lot of sidings are on a grade. Sometimes they'll fool you, they look so level. That's the very best true. way to ensure a cut doesn't start downgrade by itself or by some careless crew kicking a car against it is to set enough brakes at the lower end to prevent a rollout and disaster. This is a very important thing. Absolutely. So it's been a tough morning and a go eat sign is hard to resist. What the hell? One ought to hold them and my gut's growling anyway. First things first, I always say, remember the important things. One of them is to never turn your back on a potentially hazardous situation like this. Gravity with the horsepower of all the earth is now the engine. It's no level track on the railroad. It's another saying. discovering a mistake one more break might have held it With roller bearing cars it's hardly even a race oopsie yeah. some things are more important than others that untamed appetite cost $3,000 just to pick them up and fix them up. <laughs> and what's inside? That hasn't aged well. <laughs> in this case, busted up just when some guy's jobs depended on it. Put your feet where they'll brace you for a sudden start or stop. Okay, Superman. Don't stand or ride where you can get taken by a sneaky, nasty surprise. Flat cars. Flat cars are the danger. Now, here's a situation for you. These long drawbar cars are too far apart to jump safely. But some of those still with roof walks or with high brakes still have ladders. And you can climb down one and back up the other. But that other car there is nicely spotted for a lazy man's detour by making a couple of three-foot hops. Remember about cars moving without warning? Oopsie. No, can't win them all. Just have to climb down. What? No ladders? Oh, that's okay. We'll ask the general yardmaster to send the safety representative with an engine and a car with ladders. Meanwhile, think up a good rule book explanation for jumping from one track to another. Embarrassing, 
But funny. Not so funny, though, if that cut had moved about a half second later. No now, here's kidding. something real foolhardy. It takes only a little more effort and a little more company time to use the catwalk on this kind of car. Always use it, guys. That's an old handbrake. This really doesn't hurt. If you've got a wooden leg. Yeah. Although most accidents <laughs> involve moving equipment, a man can be far away from a car or an engine and get himself banged up. Just walking around, for instance. Every rail is a hazard to a careless man. One way to tell a guy who hasn't been around very long is to see how he crosses a track. The old head, the careful man, always steps over the rail, never on it. The danger of tripping isn't nearly as high as the danger of slipping. Here's a harmless looking... It's one of the stupidest little dumb things, but I feel like uh, when you pulled the string out of the doll that was Heiss as a supervisor, and I just played one of my canned lines like I'm Woody from uh, uh, Toy Story, one of the, the common ones was, don't put your feet where your eyes already haven't been. What does that mean? Are you putting your eyeball on the... No, you're looking. Make sure you've looked everywhere you're going to step. Cross perpendicular if you can. Uh, around the, the shop, we tried not to step on the ties because oil leaks over time and stuff. The ties ended up being really slippery, particularly in the Northwest when it's so wet. So it's like, watch your footing. Walking slash path of travel is one of the four critical exposures. Oh, God, I can still recite it even all these years later. Yeah. <laughs> they say that most of the injuries on the railroad come from people just not paying attention to where they're walking. Um, you're tired, not thinking about it, slipped on something, you know, ate a rail. Ugh. Yeah, plenty of stuff's happened like that. So always keep keep on your eye out. Make sure you haven't put your feet where your eyes already haven't been. It's a stupid saying, but it's important. Let's move from plain English to sign language. Now, what does she mean? She waving to me? Oh, I she My hero! Or something, but at this distance. Railroad hand and lantern signals have to be readable to the engine crews and your fellow switchmen. The bigger the sign, the easier it is to read. There's no room for fine print in railroad sign language. That's my pet peeve of all time, is we'll get new brakemen who... In West Coast Railroading, our signal for come towards me is moving your arms this way, coming down past the head to the chest, and going away is away from the head this way. And they'll take it into their head like, oh, it's come towards me, so I need to say, like, come towards me, because I see the, the circle is going towards the head, and so they end up doing it like this way, which when you're a train length away, you can't see. You can't see that. I don't know which way your arms are going. It just looks like they're going up and down. Make it big and obvious and go, hey, dummy up in the cab that's not looking at me. You know, do this. Go that way. Like, just do it. Feel dumb. Make the big signs. I would rather know what the hell you're trying to say than, oh, I'm, I'm doing it the cool way. No, this is not a time to try and, like, make cute little sign language movements. Like, make it big, dumb, and obvious. Trains are big, dumb, and obvious. You better be <laughs> big, dumb, and obvious when you're communicating with them, too. Now, there's another sign even more important. That is the washout. This is a vigorous stop sign, or stop right now. It's an emergency signal. It is only given when a quick stop is necessary. Yeah, our air's already dumped. You might as well go around us. Thanks, other guy. <laughs> In daylight, movement signs are directed to the engineer and tell him which way you want the engine to move relative to you. 
West Coast again, not East Coast. To come to you or go away from you. Notice the rolling oval motion of the hand and arm. This means just what it looks like. Come to me. No matter which way the engine is pointed, this signal means come to me. Again, Casey, all you East Coast people. Coming in a little too fast? Give him the easy sign, like rocking the baby. Send the engine away from you by using one or both arms this way. This is clearly a go-away motion. Seen from a distance, the arms make more of a straight line at shoulder level. Once over lightly. Stop the bottom half of a circle. Come to me, a circular motion. Go away, outward, straight from the shoulder. That's one of the ones that is a little different, again, depending on railroad. And I've seen UP and UP railroaders do that. Uh, we just continue that motion into a circle that way. That's the Rio Grande way. Comment down below, what does your railroad do? Apparently, uh, a lot of this stuff is similar, but not quite the same. <laughs> At night, or even on a murky day, this night sign with a lantern says stop. These don't say come or go, but forward or back up. You must know which way your engine is pointed. Very Don't true. The washout, but remember, it's only for emergency. Stop is the same as in daylight, a low swung arc. Forward is an up and down motion. Night signs tell the engineer whether to set the reverse lever for forward or for backup. Whether you are behind or ahead of the engine, moving it ahead requires a forward sign. And don't shine the lantern directly in the engineer's eyes Back up while you're is a at circle. it. And whether you're ahead or behind the engine, moving it backward requires a backup sign. In poor visibility daylight or at a great distance from the engineer, use night signs with a red cover or a few Z. Now one more word about night signs. Always hold your lantern so the man getting the sign can see the light. Not in his face, but so that he can see it. Yes. <laughs> I will say, I was tossing shade a little bit because I have friends who are railroaders on the East Coast, and anytime I post anything with our hand signals, it's just like, what are you guys doing? Uh... It does seem to make more sense to me the way that the East Coast does it, where they just keep the lantern signals in the day. It just translates to a slightly different hand signal. So you're always talking about, is the engine going forwards or is it going reverse rather than come towards me, go away from me? And that way it's consistent year round because Lord knows every time we get back around to night operations, there's always at least one brakeman we have to remind, like, we're running at night now. You have to remember the difference. And, you know, so... It's probably smarter to do it the East Coast way, but I imagine there's also probably upsides the way we do it. Maybe our hand signals are easier to see from far away. Railroad is made of tradition, and it's a, it's a strange thing to see how the same concept has bloomed into so many different little weird varieties across the country and the world, really. 
It's been a long day of learning. I hope you've picked up a few tips and are off on the right foot. But I've got my doubts about our poor old tired dummy. As the old head. Yes. Good man. Was he a railroader or a stuntman? That's the question. <laughs> Such a fun video. And of course, uh, I've cut some of it for time and for things that I wanted to comment on. So if you want to watch the whole video, not listen to me yak, of course, it's down in the description below. Hope you guys enjoyed watching this. And uh, railroad safety, uh, a little bit more fun than the very sterile way it's treated some of the times today. So thanks so much for watching, guys. We'll catch you all next time.